And we are, um, we are in Memorial Weekend, and tomorrow is Memorial Day. And uh, it's a time when we honor those who have given their lives for this country. And, you know, when I was thinking about a message for this weekend, I was, wasn't sure if I was going to start the new series or what, and I was praying, Lord, what should I do? And I really just felt like there was a message in Memorial Weekend for us. And, uh, you know, I think of what the soldiers went through. You know, we've seen all these war movies and these battle movies and stuff like that. And we, we know people personally have, who have been in wars and, and, and just the horrific things that happened to many of them. I mean, just unbelievable, um, just the tra- trauma that they've gone through. And then, of course, many that have lost their lives. And that's why we honor um, the dead today, those who gave their lives for this country. Um, unbeknownst to me, I was visiting my dad about 20 years ago, and my family has its own cemetery out in Virginia. And uh, my my wife and I were were walking around, and some of the headstones are from the late 16 to early 1700s. And then we came to this one huge memorial, and I was like, wow, I wonder who this is. And it turned out it was an uncle that I had that was in World War II and that he was a pilot. And uh, his plane, he was out in the South Pacific and his plane had got shot down and he was able to take his plane and, and um, dive bomb into a, a Japanese destroyer and destroy this, this Japanese destroyer. And so he had gotten this posthumous uh, you know, award and everything. And, and I was thinking about that. I was thinking, man, in a moment, how many lives were changed? In that moment, my uncle died. In that moment, however many sailors were on that Japanese destroy, destroyer died. And then all these, those lives are impacted by those deaths. It's like, wow. You know, we sit there and we, we, we cheer yay for, for us because, you know, we were considered the good guy in that moment. But All those men on the other side had families, and those families were grieving for them. They loved them. And I always wonder, why do things like this have to even happen? Why are there so many tragedies in life? Why do we go through so much in our lives? Some of you this morning are going through things. You're going through things, man. You're in in a storm that you don't understand. And it leaves some of you asking the question, does God really care about what I'm going through? I've asked this question before. And it's not that you don't believe in God. You do believe in God. You believe that God is God. But you just wonder, does he care about your pain, your heartache, your suffering, your struggles? Does he really care? Because if he did care, it seems like he'd do something about it, right? You ever wondered that? Does he notice? Does he see me? Does he notice me? Does he care at all about me? Well, church, you're not alone, man. A lot of us struggle with that. A lot of us struggle with, does God really care? Today, we're going to look at one of the miracles of Jesus. When his disciples asked the very same question of our Lord, do you even care? Title of this message is Peace in Your Panic. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would just captivate our hearts this morning. Lord Jesus, that we would draw on this story of you and your disciples in a moment that just seemed hopeless. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us and open our eyes and ears, Lord that we'd be receptive, and that we would hear, God, your voice, what you are saying to us. We ask this humbly in Jesus' name, and all the church said. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4 this morning, so if you want to open your tablets, Bibles, whatever it is, your phones. Um, The disciples in this story find themselves in an unexpected storm, right? I like what Rick Williamson says, I say this every time, you're either in the the middle, coming out, or going into a storm. That's just how life is. 
And that's what some of you are facing right now. Some of you are facing something you didn't choose, you didn't want, or you didn't expect. And you're thinking, where is God? We pick up our story in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. I'm in the NIV this morning. It says, that day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So the disciples, man, they're in this boat. They're in the middle of a storm. And, and we need to unpack these verses this morning to really get to the essence of what this message is really about. If you look at verse 35, it says, That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. This is Jesus instructing them. Now, where were they going? Well, first off, they were going to be on the Sea of Galilee. Now, this is a lake, and I have a picture of it, and this is a satellite shot. It's not a big lake. It's 13 miles long, 8 miles wide, okay? But here's the thing about the Sea of Galilee. It is known for some of the most furious storms on earth, explosive thunderstorms, gale force winds. I mean, horrific storms that just come up off of this lake. And so after an exhausting day of ministry, you can read all of chapter 4 and see all the things that Jesus and the disciples were doing. It was a long day. It was a long day. And Jesus looks at him and says, let's go to the other side. Here's what you need to understand about this. This is Jesus' idea. This isn't the disciples saying, hey, let's jump on the boat and go take a trip. Jesus says, let's get into the boat together and go to the other side. Now, here's the thing about the other side. The Gentiles lived on the other side. Jews avoided Gentiles because they were considered pagan people. And it was even rumored that the devil himself lived on the other side of Galilee. People were so superstitious about the sea and about crossing the sea and going to Galilee. But here, listen, one Bible commentator had this to say about the Sea of Galilee. The sea was known to swallow up entire ships and gulp down people. It was a common superstition to view the water as the abyss where demons lurked in the deep. The sea was considered the manifestation of the realm of death. This is what they had to say about the Sea of Galilee. Crazy. So this sea was known, in other words, to wreck havoc on people, to wreck havoc on fishermen, to just wreck havoc. And so sure enough, what happens? They get out into the boat with Jesus, and a storm blows up, man. And it's a big one. It's a serious one, and we're going to see how serious it is here in a minute. And I want you to understand what this shows us today if you are a Christ follower. Even if you are a Christ follower, you're not exempt from the storms of life. They're going to hit us. The storms of life are going to hit us. And so the storm blows up, and the disciples, they felt desperate. They were desperate. Whatever illusion of control they had, it was absolutely gone. And in Mark 4.38, it says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we, are, if we drown? I mean, in reality, what they're saying is, Teacher, if you cared, you would do something. And don't we think and live like that today? I'm in this storm, Lord. If you cared, you would do something. If you cared, I wouldn't have lost my job. If you cared, you would do something about my depression. If you cared, you would help me out of this financial hole. Lord, if you cared, my parents wouldn't have divorced. If you cared, my kids wouldn't struggle. I wouldn't be in this horrible marriage. If you cared, you would do something. That's how we think and live when we're in the storm. 
A few months back, I shared with you when my youngest son was hospitalized when he was five days old, and, and we were basically told, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. And we were in that moment when he was rushed into ICU and they're trying to get IVs into him and they can't get an IV in anywhere in his body because he, he was, his veins were so collapsed and they finally stick this IV in his head and watching that, we're just parents, we're just weeping, we're crying and our hearts are broken. And, and, I, and I told you, I remember in that moment when I put my arm around my wife and I said, Lord, please don't take another child from my wife. She had already experienced losing Matt, who was 12. Now you're going to take this one? And I'm just in desperation with the Lord. Lord! And then the glory of God just hit me, shined on my wife and I. And I heard his voice just say, trust me. Trust me. And it was just an incredible moment of being in the presence of the Lord. And I'll remind you later in the message of what God showed me in that moment. Here's what I want to bring out to you this morning, though. There's two things to remember when you're in the storm. Two things to remember in the storm. Please write this down. The first thing is, you're in the storm with his presence. You're in the storm with his presence. We forget that most of the time when we're in the storm. We forget that we're in God's presence, that Jesus is with us. Remember in in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, the first part of it says, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. Jesus was there. He was there in the storm. In fact, he had brought the disciples into the storm. This was Jesus bringing them into the storm. Here's what you need to understand. We get so caught up in the what of the storm, we forget the who is in the boat. We forget who's in the boat. Listen, write this down. The who is more powerful than the what. The who is more powerful than the what. All through Scripture, church, all through Scripture, God has promised His presence. He promises his presence. We see it all through scripture. If you look at Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, it says, God will neither fail you nor abandon you. That's what he says. Okay? Isaiah, uh, Joshua 1.5, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. Joshua 1.9, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Psalm 23, 4, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Church, listen to me. God not only promised his presence, he proves his presence. He proves his presence in our lives. Church, don't get so caught up in the what of the storm that you forget the who in the boat. Standing graveside in a cemetery. You're not alone. Jesus is with you, man. Someone breaks your heart. Jesus is with you. You lose your job. Jesus is with you. You come home to an empty apartment or house You're not alone. Jesus is with you. Why? Because he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never do that to you. I will always be with you. But here's what you need to understand. Jesus never said we wouldn't experience storms, but his promise was we would never be alone in the storms. You get that? Jesus never said we wouldn't experience them. We do experience them. You might be in one right now. But he promised he would never, you would never be alone in the storm. So the first thing is you're in the storm with his presence. The second thing is you're in the storm for his purpose. Remember, church, Jesus was the one who said, let's go to the other side. Again, it wasn't the disciples. It was Jesus that said it. They weren't in the storm because they were out of his will, church. They were in the storm because they were in his will. Sometimes we get put into a storm because it's God's will. Why? Because God wants to show us something. Right? 
I mean, I don't know. Why did Jesus allow the disciples to endure the storm? I don't know why. But maybe, just maybe, church, something they needed to learn in the storm couldn't be learned on the safety of the shore. Think about that. Something they needed to learn in the storm, they couldn't learn on the safety of the shore. They couldn't learn it. And that's the thing. Sometimes we get put into the storm because God wants to teach us a lesson, a principle. When I look back at most of the storms that I've been in, even the storms I've created, I've created some of the storms we all have, God always seems to teach me something that I would have never learned unless I went through the storm. Here's the cool thing, is that because Jesus has a purpose in the storm. Jesus is going to control that purpose, and he's going to control the storm. In verse 39 of Mark, it says, Jesus got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Wow. Like that, just like that. Jesus speaks and he rebukes the storm. Jesus speaks as one with authority. And and it reminds us that that was who Jesus was. Remember when Jesus was teaching? He was teaching the multitudes. He was teaching the people. And they would come away and say, wow, he teaches as one with authority. See, Jesus has authority in our lives. Jesus has the authority to do what he needs to do in our lives. Jesus has the ability to start and stop a storm because he has all the authority. And here's what you need to understand. He just doesn't say, please stop, wind, please. No, he rebukes it. That word means that it was done with so much force. There was so much power behind what he did. He said, quiet, be still. The commentators tell us that in that moment, it was like, it was like watching one of those movies and there's this, this, all this stuff is going on and then in a minute there's this, this, this moment where something happens, a force happens and just, when everything is just calm. That's what happened. It wasn't like hours later, the wave, like that, it takes hours for the waves to start, stop moving and all that after a big windstorm. But no, it was instantly calm and quiet. Now here's the thing that trips me out, man. This kind of cool. Peter... Peter is freaking out on the boat. Him and the other guys on the boat, these guys are professional fishermen. This is what they do every day. They go out and they catch fish. So this cannot be the first storm Peter's ever been in. He's had tons of storms that he's dealt with in his life. But all of a sudden, he's in a storm. And it's at a magnitude he has never experienced. Man, they are tripping. But Peter is going to write something later on about the purpose of the storm, what he learned in the storm. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, he says this, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The very question that they asked Jesus, don't you care? Peter responds with, you know what? I'm just going to cast everything on him because he does care. He's got my back, man. Jesus has my back. Now, it's interesting that this word cast in the Greek is only used one other time in the Bible. Now, here's what this word means. It translates into transfer, like transferring weight or transferring something to somebody else. It's like if you run the relay and you have a baton in your hand, and and as you get close to the next person who's going to run, you pass the baton with them. You pass that, that baton, the weight to them, and they carry it for the rest of the way. The thought is the same here in what Peter is saying right? You're going to transfer your anxiety or whatever it is that you're going through. You're going to transfer it off of you to the one who can handle it. Jesus can handle it. Now, most people say, let go and let God. But if you let go, if you let go of a weight and it drops, it could crush your feet. It can hurt you. No, we transfer We transfer the weight. We transfer the the burden to God. And here's what happens. When we do that, it actually makes you anxious for God. 
It makes you anxious to be in his presence. Maybe this morning you're afraid for the future of a relationship. Take that anxiety and give it to God. Transfer it to God. Maybe you're worried about a, a teenager. Maybe it's a, a, a son or a daughter or a granddaughter or a grandson, whatever it is. Transfer that weight, that anxiety to Jesus. Maybe this morning you're freaking out about your finances, man. You don't know how you're going to make it. Transfer that to Jesus. Transfer that. Your, your career path, your health issue, whatever it is, Take the anxiety and say, Lord, I cannot take this. It's too big of a burden here. And Jesus will gladly take it. And here's what you need to understand. When we transfer this to God, right? People say, well, that's irresponsible. I should be taking it into my own hands. I need to handle this situation. No, it's not irresponsible. It's not you quitting. It's actually a very powerful, powerful moment. Because you realize this. That God is greater. God is more able to handle whatever it is that you're dealing with. So here's the question. Do you really believe there's an all-powerful, ever-present, all-knowing God who cares for you? Do you really believe that? Because sometimes, I'll be honest, I don't. I struggle. I'll be like, God, where are you in this? What's going on, man? So I need reminders. That's why I need to read the Word. That's why I need to absorb the Word of God, to hear those reminders that God is with me. He's not going to forsake me. That God is going to work all things for the good for those who love Him are in in his purpose. See, what you need to understand here is Peter didn't believe that Jesus cared or could handle the situation. The desperation in Peter's voice and the other disciples' voice was like, Lord, really? But then he does see that Jesus cared. He does see it. And the reason we know he's seen it and he was living it, is because he writes it. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Churches, church storms come. They come, but you're not alone. Remember, in the storm, you're with him, and, and he's working out his purpose. And remember another thing. God cares for the brokenhearted. He draws near to the desperate. Are you desperate this morning? Are you desperate? There's times when I'm so desperate for God. I'm just screaming out for him. Lord. He's close to those who are crushed in spirit. You may be rejected by people, but you're never abandoned by God. God is so amazing. And that storm with my youngest son, I'll never forget how much turmoil I was in. I can't speak for Mama Bear, but I know for me I was in turmoil. I was, in, I was so broken in that moment. I was thinking, God, you can't do this, man. And I'm crying out to the Lord. I'm crying out to the Lord. I'm crying out to the Lord. And when the Lord, I'm telling you, his glory just shone. I saw this brightness, and it just encapsulated us. He said, trust me. And in that minute, those words were so powerful. The storm was gone. And a peace flooded my heart like I had never experienced. It was amazing. There was a a family room where you could go and wait and everything while your, your kids are in the ICU and stuff like that. We went and sat in the family room for a moment. I looked at my wife. I said, you know what? We're going home. We are going to go home, and we're going to rest because we're going to need this rest because the next few days or however many days it was going to be are going to be hard. But the Lord said, trust me. And we went home, and I couldn't believe it. We fell asleep, and I, got a, I woke up at around 6.15 in the morning. And I, I Immediately, I called the ICU unit. 
I said, I says, Mr. Dalton, I want to know how my son Nathaniel's doing and stuff like that. And the nurse just said, it's a miracle. His vitals are back up to where they need to be at. You guys need to come in so we can talk about a treatment plan. And I just looked at my wife and I said, man, God is so amazing. Would God have still been good if he'd have taken our son home? He would have. But you know what? He knew we couldn't take it. He knew it was going to be too much. And in his grace and mercy, he allowed him to stay. And he's had given me 30 years of heartache. So, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but church, there are things that we learn in the storm. And I would have never learned about God's peace in the midst of some trial if, it, if he hadn't put me through that. And I've been through a lot of storms, a lot of storms in my life. And I'm not saying that I fly with, that I, I, I pass with fly, pass with flying colors, is that it? Yeah. Not saying that I do every time, but I always think back to that moment when it was like, God, you were there, and then in probably one of the hardest times of my life. And so wherever you're at in the storm, if you're in the middle of a storm right now, or if you're going into a storm, or if you're coming out of a storm, here's one thing I want you to understand, is one day the storms will come to an end. They're not going to last forever. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Jesus is going to rebuke it all. There is a time coming, church, when all things are going to be renewed. There's a time when God is going to restore those who are sick. Heal all who are depressed. Bring joy to those who mourn. End all rejection. Wipe away every tear. Tell death, man, get on out of here. You got no place. That time is coming. That time is coming, but it's not here yet until that time comes. We're in what we're in. And if you haven't noticed, there's a lot of storms brewing on this earth today. And I'm not talking storms of nature. I'm talking about storms that are coming. Storms that are coming for us as Christians. It's going to get harder and harder for us to speak the name of Jesus. It's going to get harder and harder for us to live out our faith. It's going to get harder and harder for us. Things are being put into position that one day we're not going to have the freedoms that we have. It's coming, and you need to be aware of it. You need to be aware of the things that are happening around us and saying, hey, I need, to, I need to start thinking about some things. Because we're in a storm. And the storm keeps brewing. And the storm's getting bigger. But as I said, there's a day when Jesus will make all things new. He's going to make all things new, church. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. We're going to be living with Jesus for, forever. But until then, church, we need to gather in the boat. We need to gather in the boat. And what is the boat, church? What is the boat that we have today? It is the church. The church is the boat. This is it. It's a place where you can come. When you have nowhere else to go, you can come through these doors. See, I don't, I don't care who comes through the doors. Everybody is welcome here. That's our logo. That's, what, that's our motto. No one's perfect. All are welcome. All are welcome. I leave it to Jesus to change hearts and minds. That's not my job. That's Jesus' job. But people need to come to a place where they can be loved and accepted. Because the church for too long has been the biggest cancel culture in America. Way too long. If you don't come in and fit in like us, well, you, you're not welcome. We are all sinners saved by grace. And the church needs to be a safe place. A place where you can belong, believe, and become what God wants you to become. A place where if you were sick, you can become healthy. That you can be right, even though you're a sinner. This is a place where you can come and be loved and cared for. Yes, there's going to be Times when we don't get along or we fight and argue or whatever it is. So what? That's life. That's how it is. We're human beings. But we need each other. 
This is the lifeboat right here. This is the lifeboat. We need to stay together, church. We need to stay together, man. Right? Cast all our cares on him. That's what we do. That's what we do collectively here. We cast all our cares on Jesus. Why? Because he cares for us. Until Jesus rebukes the devil, rebukes the fallen world, until the old heaven and earth disappear and all things are made new, we have got to stay in the boat together. You got an issue? Work it out. Plain and simple, man. That's what needs to happen. Because we need each other in the lifeboat. I need you. And hopefully you need me. Because that's how it works. That's how it works. Whatever storm you're in, whatever the storm you're in this morning, you're in the safest place you can be. You're here. You're here with us. And you're here with Jesus. Because remember in the storm, you have Jesus' presence and Jesus' purpose. And what we're to do is stay in the boat and trust him and watch what he does because it will always bring him glory if we stay in the boat with him. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for your word today. And Lord, as we honor those who have fallen for this country, Lord, I know there was many times that there had to have been so much panic in their hearts. And I, I've read stories of men who just instantly had a peace, knowing that you were with them, God, in those times. And so, Lord, help us to remember, Lord, in our storms, you're with us and that you have a purpose. And, Father, whatever you have for our lives, God, we want to submit ourselves. May today be the day when we say, Lord, I surrender to you. Everything that I have is yours. Everything that I am is yours. And see the miraculous work of God in our lives. We pray for those who are traveling today, God, who are away from us, Lord, that you would be with them and bless them, Lord. And Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. We ask this humbly now in Jesus' name. And all the church said.